Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and I give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three books that are full of random tables for you, you to use as a GM or a DM during your adventure design or dungeon design or world building process. Uh, I'm going to be going through the, the Dungeon Alphabet by Michael Curtis, The Dungeon Dozen by Jason Schultes, and The Tome of Adventure Design by Matthew Finch. These three books are all really good and fantastic books. They're full of tables for you to use, and if you're one of those DMs that gets kind of hung up during your dungeon process, or you tend to be pretty samey in the way that you design dungeons, your creativity isn't flowing either generally or maybe at the moment, then these books are great ways to kickstart your creativity. Uh, now, they're uh, they're full of, some in some cases, very specific tables, like hyper-specific tables even. So these aren't just generally useful all the time, at least not all the tables are. Sometimes you're gonna have to seek out the table that you want. And therefore, I would say these, these books are a little less useful to, to me as a, as a designer. I tend to not, when I'm building my dungeons, I tend to not go to these books. I have them and I like them and I have used them in my design process before. But very often when I'm designing something, I either forget that the specific table that would be useful to me is in the books, because there's so many of them, I forget which ones are there. And so I just Google instead, or like I'll Google a question that I have a, 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 you know, a table online, or I'll go to like Reddit or something like that, which is much faster for me. Or I will be reading through this book and I'll be like, that's a great idea. I should use that in a dungeon. And then I forget about it. So there, you know, some people don't do that. Some people, they, they keep these sorts of things in their mind. They remember the sorts of tables that are in these books and therefore they can draw on them much more effectively. And then other people like to read these books for inspiration as they like, they'll start off with these books, right? And they're like, I want to do a dungeon or I want to do a world or I want to, and I want just some crazy ideas that I want in that world. And you'll read through these books and you'll roll on some tables. And then after that, you'll take what you've rolled and build your own dungeon. Some people do that too. I don't tend to do either of those things. I much prefer to have tables that are very quick and easy, but also things that are more open-ended, things that ask me questions for me to kind of work on my own with creativity, things that are more like, hey, what sort of thing is here? Rather than roll on this table and see what sort of thing is there. Um, so if you're, again, I think this is good for anybody to have. They're great books just to have in the hobby as a GM. It's great to have these in your back pocket if you need them. How useful are they depends on the kind of GM you are. If you're a random table GM, if you like having these wacky gonzo elements in your dungeon, you're certainly gonna like the first two books, The Dungeon Dozen and The Dungeon Alphabet. If you're someone who has a process, much more methodical, then you're probably gonna find the Tome of Adventure Design much more useful. Uh, but anyway, let's go through them and you get a sense of what's in them. So let's start with The Dungeon Alphabet by Michael Curtis. First of all, the art in this book is excellent. Errol Otis, uh, Stefan Poag, just a whole bunch of great artists contributed to this one. Essentially, it's an, it's an alphabet, A to Z, with at least one, usually two, but sometimes just one, entries, random tables for each of those entries, right? So you have an introduction, but then you get A is for altars with, you know, random altar generator. And then you get a great piece of art there. And then A is also for adventurers with some information about that, and then a D12 table for a dozen unusual adventuring bands. Right, so for every alphabetical entry in this book, there's at least one or two random tables associated with that letter. So B is for books, and you get special properties of books, and then you get 100 book titles, which is awesome. I've definitely used this table before. If I know my players are gonna go into like a, a library, I'll often just have this book open. B is also for battles, and you get 20 unforeseen developments during a battle. Roll a d20 and suddenly X happens. Now, this is one of those entries where I could see you doing a couple things with this. I could see you either printing this off and putting it on your screen or just having it open during a game. And if there's a combat that kind of starts to slow down, you roll on the table. That's useful. It's only going to be useful for so long because if you just use it as a standard way to make your adventures exciting, you can make you only do it for 20 battles, right? If you make them each different. Rather, I think you should use this as inspiration. What that means, though, is that you're not going to be doing this for every battle, right? Because especially if you're playing an OSR game, there's a lot of random encounters. And very often you can generate interesting encounters by having different motivations or different complications. And those are much easier to develop than having this kind of crazy unforeseen development happening in the middle of a battle. If it happens every time, obviously your players are going to get used to that. So you wouldn't want to use it every time. You would want to use this then as sort of like a key boss moment fight. So if you're developing a boss fight, you might have a chance that something could happen in the middle of the fight. And this table would give you great inspiration for that. 
This is what I mean when I say I don't tend to use these tables very much because when I'm developing a boss fight, I tend to not think about the fact that I need something crazy to happen halfway through. Or if I do, I have an idea of what I want to happen. I don't really often have to go to a random table to check to see what should happen, right? And so it's kind of a, it's a, it's an, it's a good thing to remind you to do that sometimes you should have these unforeseen developments and here are some good ideas for it. And I could see reading through this table, reading one of these and saying, oh, that's a good idea. I'm gonna develop an encounter where that is sort of the, the idea where this is gonna happen halfway through So you, you build an encounter based on this. Uh, then you get C is for caves, C is also for a cipher. This is one that I think would be very useful ahead of time because you know when you're developing a puzzle, you're not really gonna develop those on the fly. And so if you have a cipher that the players need to figure out or something and, and the details of it, uh, here's what you would have. You roll, roll it up on here. C is for crypts and a dozen creepy crypts. Cool idea. Some of them are, you know, things that you'd probably expect, some that you've, you've seen before. Others are a little bit more weird. D is for doors. Actually, I want to mention one thing. One thing that we haven't seen very much is number 12, that the, the crypt is not yet in use. That would be kind of interesting, right? Like a tomb that's being prepared for something that's still alive. That would be a really cool place, a dungeon, right? So you go to, there's a, the evil, you know, pharaoh, mummy, god emperor thing that is still tyrannizing the land. He's built this massive tomb for himself. And within that tomb is the secret to his demise. So you have to, you have to delve into the tomb that hasn't yet been filled with him and his undead minions. Maybe it's full of builders or protectors or the traps are all active. Like, I mean, it's a cool idea. That's something I could see building a dungeon around as you're reading through. And that's sort of what these books are for. 20 interesting dungeon doors. This one's probably much more at the table you roll. D is for dragons. Great idea. If you're developing an interesting dragon, you've got a 2d8 table for what makes the dragon interesting. There's some cool entries here. That The dragon is a construct. The dragon is recently hatched. The dragon is a god. Or the dragon is a hoax. I like that one, number 16. There isn't actually a dragon here. It's actually, you know, a bunch of uh, kobolds, or it's a bunch of creatures who are trying to pretend and make believe there's a dragon there so no one comes in. That's a cool idea. E is for echoes. Six ways to use echoes. It's kind of a cool idea, but again, not something that I would really think to do. I, when I'm designing a dungeon, I don't go, hmm, I want to make an echo puzzle here or something interesting with an interesting echo here. I, I'm going to go see if there's a random table for ways to use echoes. Again, it's something I'd probably be reading through and say, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to try to add that into a dungeon the next time I design it. I might make a note about it. And then the next time I design a dungeon, hopefully I see that note. That's kind of how I operate. E is for entrances. Uh, F is for fungi. G is for gold. G is also for guardians. Ten terrible guardians defending terrific treasures. H is for hallways. H is also for hazards. A half score of hazardous happenings. That's a great idea. Um, I is for inscriptions. J is for jewels, K is for kobolds, 10 unique kobold tribes. This could go right along with uh, Skirple's uh, Monsters Compendium, that book that I've reviewed other uh, in another video. Uh, L is for levers, 30 results for a pulled lever. Uh, L is for levels, 20 dungeon level themes. Uh, M is for magic, odd magical devices found in the dungeon, quite a lot of them. M is for maps, 12 unusual maps found in a dungeon. N is for no stone left unturned, 20 random places to hide things. Oozes, omens, pools, potions, questions, quests, rooms, lots of different tables for room purposes, which you could add with a lot of other dungeon design books, some that I have reviewed. Uh, you could make that a, a way of building a random dungeon out if you wanted. Relics, statues, stairs, traps, treasure chests, undead, underwater, vermin, vegetation, weird, perplexing things and events of a weird nature, D12 table for just weird stuff to throw into your dungeon. That's good, especially if you tend to, as I often do, tend towards ending up with something more mundane at the end of my, I, I, I go back to, you know, lots of my standard fantasy tropes. And I go back to crypts and goblins and tombs and orcs and undead and very often the weird gets left out of my dungeons. And so having just like, I'm going to roll something weird. That's kind of cool. X is for xenophobia. Eight ways to shake up the adventurer's preconceived notions about monsters. Okay, it's kind of interesting. Y is for yellow. Or yeah, yeah, Y is for yellow. Six sinister uses of the color yellow. It's kind of interesting. And then Z is for zowie, which is, again, something kind of weird, really bizarre in your dungeon, throwing something in there that you'll really remember. Like the rusting remains of a 57 Chevy or a casino gambling house run by monsters or the mother of all puddings.
So this book is only 82 pages, but it's great. It's got a lot of great entries, really good for inspiration, great art throughout. I could see some people making immense use of this book and other people just seeing it sort of as like an interesting, fun artifact to read through. That's kind of the second is how I tend to see it. I've used this a few of these tables a handful of times. They're great when I need them. I just often forget about them or I don't feel the need to go to this book to use them. I, I just either develop my own or I'll do a quick Google search. And that's how I feel about a lot of these random tables here. They're separate enough and specific enough that it's more of an effort to go find them <laughs> than it is to go Google something. I, I feel differently about Maze Rats. I look both like Maze Rats where you have so many great tables all on the same page right there. That's useful to me because I can look when I want to make NPCs, that's a comprehensive NPC generator on one and two pages. Then I know I can click a random one, but I like the sort of NPCs as that generates for me. And it has a lot of utility because it's so open-ended and because there's so many different tables that you can combine in interesting ways. These are more specific, right? There's a specific entry with a sometimes paragraph of text that's associated with that entry and you could mix and match, but it would be much harder to do so. So it's a it's less on the fly useful. It's less, um, I would say less flexible of a tool, but it's still great. It's still fun. And it's, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of fun to own. Again, I think it's worth getting for any DM just to have in their collection, uh, a PDF at the very least. The next book that I wanted to cover is The Dungeon Dozen by Jason Schultes. Now this doubles down on that feature that I just mentioned. This is not 82 pages. This is 225 pages. Each of those is a different D12 table. And when J Jason says that they are random tables, he means random tables. These are bizarre, absolutely, entirely bizarre. I, I like it as reading inspiration. I don't think I ever have used this that effectively because these tables are so specific. So for example, additional nuisances in the frozen wastes, apocalyptic visions in the crystal ball, almost indestructible villain death requirements, also in residence at the inn, antediluvian relics at the bottom of the pit, atypical items found in desk, automatic weird dragons, available means of interplanetary travel. But this book is basically just for inspiration because to use it at the table is, again, just so hyper-specific. How often are you going to run into the particular situation that is used on this table? There are a handful of tables that are much more generically useful. Um, clerics, for example, before they were first level, what was their background? You could use that for any cleric, right? Uh, before first levels for dwarves, what were they like before they went adventuring? Great little table to roll for adventurers, but there's 12 entries, so you're not going to use it all the time. And once you've used it up, you're not going to come back to this. So the more generic tables are less, um, they don't have as long lasting impact. They're not as useful in that sense. The, the more specific tables are the sorts of things I'm probably not going to run into very much, but there are so many of them that the book feels like you kind of need it just because you're like, well, there's so many different tables in here. Surely this is a, a source of inspiration for me. And that's what it is. Again, it's a source of inspiration, especially once you get into like benevolent parasites of the underworld, right? Uh, a love fungus grows internally, releases pheromones to attract mates for host, increases personal charm. Throw that into a dungeon. Like, oh, I really like that. I really want to use that in a dungeon. So the next time I do a, you know, maybe have a separate document with ideas for dungeons and you just take the ones you like from this book and add them into that document. And then when you're going through to prepare a dungeon, you look at that and you're like, oh, that's right. I remember that entry from that book. And you go through there. That's how I would use this. Those blood curdling screams off in the distance are actually, see, I mean, 20 pages in and you've gotten campaign world threatening emergencies, cheap dungeon gross out, subtle pit con trap contents, contents of a giant's lunchbox, corpses in the dungeon, corpses in the wilderness, cult imperatives of the city folk, current favorite items in the dragon's hoard, demons and devils, other de details for the otherwise empty dungeon room. I mean, again, uh, just so many tables. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I'm just going to go ahead for a bit and then stop and we'll do more. We'll read them through more of them. So here we go. Gigantic monsters, Gonzo bioweaponry, Gonzo class race generator. Options two, uh, additional, Gonzo footwear, hard times for the city folk, haunting the skies, hell's lesser inhabitants, how the gang got together, human frailties, going down further. Uh, let's see. Oddities of the swamp, on or around the war mighty warrior's carcass, on devil prince's escape-proof aisles, the oracle has bad news. Other travelers in the wilderness caravan, outrageous attire of the city folk, 
over-the-counter dungeon unguents. Unguents? Unguents? Uh, one of the problems with these, this book in particular, which is not so much the problem with the dungeon alphabet, is that there, since there are so many tables, it's just almost impossible to find the one that you want. There's a good index, there's a good table of contents. Uh, there, the index is divided by subject and by uh, sort of object. Basically, if, if, the, if a particular word is in any entry in a table, you can find it. And so if you're like, I want to look up gods, you'll find all the entries about gods and all of the all the tables about gods and all of the results that include the word god in them. So you can do that. So there's a, there's a good index. But even with that, I find this hard to use just because there are so many. Um, and sometimes like quick cultural quirks, the barbarian. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a Q, not a B. So again, I could go to the end and look at Barbarian, but if I'm just looking at, oh yeah, Barbarian, what? that's right, I gotta look for the B. No, okay, wait, I gotta go to the index and look at the word Barbarian. Okay, now which table did I want again? It's on this page, which was the one that gave me the cultural quirks? I mean, again, it's hard. This is probably just me. I'm not good at this sort of thing, but I think a lot of people aren't good at this sort of thing. And given the ease with which I can Google and get a lot of this information, I'm not gonna be using this while I'm actually prepping. That's what I'm going to turn to Google for. That's what I'm going to turn to Maze Rats for. That's what I'm going to turn to Shadow Dark for with their tables. The easy using the Nave when it comes out and the easy use tables there. This one is much harder for me to use. But that is a, an upside, right? It's a downside because it's hard for me to use. It's an upside because the reason it's hard for me to use is just the sheer number of tables in here. I'm going to go down again more. The Sorcerer's late, Latest Research Breakthrough. Going all the way down. Let's go to... Yeah, but this troll... Yeah, but this vampire, zealots in the streets, and then finally get your quick reference. So this is what I mean. So if you have character, background, bad news, oracle they're from, classes, uh, clerics, dwarves, elves, fighters, what fighters utter when they're dying, magic users, death, injury, different kinds of trauma, blunt force trauma, post-traumatic dungeon disorder, and symptoms, uh, dun city dressing, dungeon dressing, if you keep this index open, it will be much more useful. You'd kind of have to jump back and forth, and uh, it's not hyperlinked, so you just would have to scroll to it or type it in. Uh, but it's it's much more useful than just reading through it in that sense. Even so, I would find this to be hard, at least, again, I have found it hard to use uh, effectively as a, con as a uh, consistent prep tool. But as a source of inspiration, I really like it. I have used a lot of the ideas out of here as I've just read through it for fun. That's, I think, again, how I've been using these books. But again, if you're someone who really, really likes, uh, you're someone who really has a good memory for these tables, who indexes don't bother, right? My, my, my eyes glaze over. But if that doesn't bother you at all and you're able to kind of make use of that, this is a great tool. Great tool. And it's a great tool, period, because of the, the, the amount of inspiration. And like I said, I tend to fail when it comes to making the weird and the gonzo and the really creative wild things happening in the dungeon you're going to get that in these tables because there are some of them are really bizarre and they're going to be cool combinations of things you didn't think of so you're like i'm going to do i'm just going to look in this book and i'm going to pick 10 ideas and i'm going to add them into my campaign that would be a great way to use this book and you'd be like all right now i have this weird thing and that weird thing and you could build your own adventure out of it now both of these first two books the dungeon alphabet and the dungeon dozen are essentially just kind of more gonzo, random tables for lots of different topics. Dungeon Alphabet tends to focus on things that are more typical for a dungeon, like altars and treasure and dragons. The Dungeon does and does whatever. The Tome of Adventure Design, which is the third one that I'm looking through, is comprehensive. This is 300 pages. I'm not going to go through all of it. It's 300 pages, pages of how to, from A to Z, 15 times over, develop an adventure in every aspect with random tables. A little bit of advice, but mostly random tables. So this book is just insane. Book one is the principles and starting points. Uh, an introduction to book one, adventure design general principles with ways to generate locations, missions, the villain's plan, and concluding remarks on book one. Then you get book two, and that's how to generate monsters. Lots and lots of, of monster tables monster types and then different things, uh, abilities and attacks that they have and weaknesses and all that stuff. Book three is dungeon design. This is how to develop your actual dungeon. So the creative process that you should use with advice on that 
the basic elements of that sort of adventure design that focuses on dungeons, and then designing a specific dungeon adventure. Mysteries and clues, the map, tricks, traps, dungeon dressing, and then miscellaneous useful tables. And then you get lists of tables in each book, which is helpful. At the end of each book, you have a list of the tables in that book. So this one, it realizes it's huge, and it tries to do uh, tries to make your life as easy as possible by doing a, a list of tables in each book at the end of each book. The end of the whole PDF, you get a complete list of tables as well as a consolidated index. So it does its best to help you. Um, now again, there's nothing hyperlinked here, which would be nice. Um, I got this book a few years ago. I don't actually know if they have released an updated version since then. They probably have, and if they have, then there might be hyperlinks in that one. I don't know about that at all, but it would be something to add. It would be like on the list of priorities for me to make the index and all of that, if I were designing it, um, to make that hyperlinked. I guess you have an inter look at the size of the font here. <laughs> this is 300 pages, but it's 300 pages of small font. Uh, they're trying to get as much possibly uh, at you and in your hands as possible, which is this book's uh, greatest strength. It's just a wealth, an absolute wealth, a dragon's hoard, if you will, of information and tables. Uh, so different uh, principles, how you're developing a dungeon and the ways to think about uh, that adventure, so I should say, the the elements of a masterpiece, right? Backstory, location, opposition, variation of challenge, exploration, the race against time, resource management, milestones and conclusions, and continuation options. That's what a good masterpiece adventure has, right? There's something behind it. There's a location in which it occurs. There's the enemy that you're fighting. There's a variation in the challenges you're doing. There's an element of exploration and finding out fun stuff and, and, and taking risks to find it. There is a time pressure. There is some way of managing resources and a limited amount of resources. There is something that you achieve, and then there is a potential continuation. That's a great way to break down an adventure and a way to think about it. And then here you begin with the tables. Uh, table 1-1A, Locations Overview. <laughs> this is in it's incredible. You roll four times on D100 table and you get a name of a location. So let's say you roll 23, you get the corroded, you roll a 10, bridge of the, and then you roll a 50, ice, and you roll an 81, scholar. The corroded bridge of the ice scholar. That's a location in your world. All right, there you go. You could roll straight across, obviously. A 54 is the enclosed halls of the insane head. But you'll notice that there isn't repetition here. These are all unique. You know, a lot of D100 tables we will, like, double up Especially when you're talking about like naming something, they'll say like, you know, here are four entries that are all the entombed because you're going to run into that a lot. Nope, this one has a different entry for each of them. It's just incredible. Now that's 1-1A. Here's 1-1B. This is, the difference here is that 1-1B puts preference on the singular and it, it seems to be about a person rather than a thing. So, or a creature sort of like that, I guess, is one way of looking at it. So uh, let's look again. You, you have a uh, number six, you have the blue bastion of the bear beast, right? Or 13 is the coastal castle of the cloned cleric. It, insane. Now, I guess there were some of those in the first one too, wizards, warlords, but it tends to be more, uh, well, no, I guess it's just, it's just a different set of tables. I mean, again, what are the differences between these tables? They're all different. That's what it is. These are all completely different entries. So it's two D100 tables to come up with locations and the names of those locations. That's incredible. Um, this is a place to start. And, and there's a good note there. It says this, keep in mind that when you finish developing this location and this adventure, you might have something very different than where you start. That's fine. This is a, a, this is a place to start the way that you're thinking about developing your dungeon or your adventure. Start there and then develop out of it. And then if you change it over the process, fine. You're not married to that first role. Then you can do the approach, the purpose approach. What's the what's the purpose of the adventure rather than a location? Or rather, what's the purpose of the location rather than uh, just the des description of it, right? So maybe it's a crypt cocoon, right? Or maybe it's an outer portal. Or maybe it's a ghoul hive. Maybe it's a growth house. <laughs> maybe it's a guard room. That's a pretty straightforward one. Maybe it's an eye forge. Just crazy uh, uh, amount of inspiration ideas here as you begin. I'm going to make a, a location that is a witch well. I'm going to make the winter webs. The tentacle tower. The spell vats. I mean, just any of those could be turned into an awesome adventure. 
Now you have missions, right? The types of missions, individual based missions. So trying to interact with somebody or deal with somebody. What about an item based mission, right? So this one, an item based mission is you're trying to get something as opposed to do something with someone. Location based missions, trying to get into, infiltrate, liberate a place or whatever it might be, destroy a dungeon. That'd be kind of interesting, right? Your whole goal is to destroy a dungeon. And then there's an event-based mission. You try to plan and execute a swindle, or you're trying to escape from an assassination. Patrons or targets, a D1000 table for different patrons and targets. I mean, give me a break, right? I mean, this is absurdly huge, amazing how much information is here and how many options are here. They're all different. Now, you'll see that there are several ent uh, there are several different usurper entries, but one is a criminal usurper, one is a guild usurper, one is a political usurper, and one is a religious usurper. These are all different. There's lots of different victims, but one is a victim of counterfeit, assault, kidnap, murder, rumors, slander, theft. So each of these 1,000 entries is different than the others. Incredible. Patron motivations. Hooks and motivations. The villain's plan. What's the villain actually want? What kind of plan is he you know, cooking up? Is it concealment? Is it increase his personal capability? Is it evoke a catastrophic event? Is it support evil groups secretly? Is it food? Does he want to eat? What's the villain's plan? If it's a concealment plan, who is he concealing it from? And how is he concealing it? If it's a conversion plan, What's his method of conversion? If it's a desecration plan, how does he plan to do it? If it's a ceremony, what kind of ceremony? And what are some of the key features of that ceremony? If he's trying to destroy a community, what's the intended method of destruction, etc., etc., etc.? So many options. Now, when I said the other books, the Dungeon Alphabet and the Dungeon Dungeon Dozen, I actually haven't used very much in my prep because they're hyper-specific, um, and, and just because I don't tend to think of it in that way, and it's a little hard to, to make use of in some ways. Um, you know, that was just simply because of the hyper-specificity. In this one, this book is absolutely comprehensive from beginning to end. Very often, I don't use this book because I get overwhelmed. I'm like, man, there's so much here. I, I don't need all of this, but I, I'm glad that I have it. I should, I, should, I should make an adventure based on this, and you could. You could just build an adventure from beginning to end based on this many adventures, infinite adventures. This one book is all that you would ever need to develop an infinite number of adventures. And they would be completely varied. It wouldn't be very samey. They would be, each of them would be different. Goodness, this book is shockingly big. Here's a list of tables of, of all the entries in this book. Tables 1A, 1-1A, all the way through 1-35 human minions, uh, which and, and unusual human minions at the very end. Oh, my goodness. That was just the initial construction of the adventure, the location, and the villain and his minions. Now we have book two, which is monsters. This is coming up with your own monsters. Or modifying monsters to make them interesting. There's different categories of monsters with animals and the creature types that you might have. So camels, crabs, barracuda fish, frogs, roaches, etc. Then there's a folklore shape adaptation, right? So you have a, a change to this uh, base creature, animal creature type. What, how does it obtain food? How does it reproduce? What kind of abstract food does it might, might it eat? Does it eat your charisma, your wisdom, your youth? Those were animals, keep in mind. Now we have constructs, type of construct. And the comments on that elemental construct or that magically animated object. The physical danger posed by it. What does it actually do to you to hurt you? Modern analogs for fantasy devices. So think about modern, uh, uh, modern machinery. And then you can shift that over into a more um, fantasy equivalent. Reasons for creating a construct. What's, how, what does it physically resemble? And what happens when you lose, it loses control? How does it lose control? Draconic entries. Features. Unusual features. A great D100 table for that. 
what is a dragon's unusual ability? What is its unusual breath weapon? Uh, what is its mentality's motivation and status? And then elementals, fey creatures, with great entries for fey creatures like methods of summoning and methods of immobilization and uh, properties, uh, contracts that they want to bring about. I love that. Giants, horrors, humanoids, lots and lots, mist creatures, oozes and macrobiotes, planar creatures, demonic creatures, tons of entries. There's travelers, planar creature type, plant creatures, undead, with tons of different ways that these undead come about. Like, how does this undead occur? There's a break in nature, and there's a D100 table for how this particular undead is formed. And that would give you an insight into the kind of creature it was and the way it would fight and all of those things, the manner in which this particular one died. Verminous creatures. General monster tables. So physical and special attacks with a special defense. You roll on this to develop an overall combat profile. And then it depends on what kind of role you've succeeded in rolling. So say you rolled an 86. It has a head attack, has limb attacks, has one special attack. Okay, so you'd go through the head attack. What is its head attack? Well, it has a tongue attack. And it had two limb attacks. So this one's pseudopods and clubbing limbs. It tells you what it looks like. It has a body attack too. This one engulfs and digests. And it had one tail attack, which is a stinger, say. So you roll and it has an example result. All right, great. So you have this whole list. And then you can develop that idea into what it looks like and make it all work together. Special attack delivery method. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Uh, so many special attacks, a D100 table for special attacks that are all really cool with details on how they would work. Keep in mind, this is basically system neutral, but it assumes some things. It assumes, for example, that you're going to be, uh, you have basic stats like wisdom, for example, right? It assumes that sort of thing. Uh, but otherwise, it's all in general terms. So slow, for example, this sort of attack slows down the victim, probably to half speed at everything, but po possibly only in terms of movement or attack speed. It depends on how the monster does it. The effect might just be magic, which slows down opponents. It might relate to manipulation of time or other dimensions, or it might be that the monster produces an external cause like glue or webs that slow people down. So gen generic advice, but specific to the, I mean, generic in terms of system, but specific to the kind of effect it's having. Uh, the effects of fear that it can bring about, transformations that it can bring about. Special defenses or abilities, distinctive attributes nature of cycle or yeah the nature of the cycle so if it has a reproductive cycle or if it changes its form you can do that mode of organization and the features of the uh, highly intelligent creatures so you have 86 tables here <laughs> 2 1 to data 2 86 wow great piece of art there book three dungeon design so this is just about the dungeon design process how you develop a dungeon, how you sculpt the dungeon, um, how you finally build it, using poetry as an example <laughs> in the final stanza of Jabberwocky. So basic elements of adventure design. Again, book one approach was backstory, location, opposition, variation of challenge, exploration, race against time, resource management, milestones, conclusions, and continuation options. Book three looks at adventure design from the point of view of a dungeon or a particular place. So you have time element, motivation element, information element, tactical element, monstrous element, movement element, and miscellaneous element. Those are all going to be ways of approaching adventure. Again, or, or rather, it's a different approach, but different features you want to consider when you're developing an adventure. So there are different ways of doing this. Now, the book makes note that these are all going to be mixed up, practically speaking. Here are nature of races against time, different races against time. Motivation, the motivational element, enticements to peril. What are you actually, why are you actually coming on this adventure? Information element, tactical element, with tactical challenges, reasons why this particular has a tactical, you know, a tactical interest here, tactical setup and challenge. Monstrous element, map design. Uh, Challenges to the character sheet. This is a really interesting idea, too, that there should be challenges to the character sheet. So ability checks, flat chances, random selection, or saving throws. Those are checks not against the player, but against the character. I like that idea that you should make distinctions there between challenges to the character sheet and challenges to the player. Especially in an OSR style of game, that distinction makes a lot of difference. Uh, makes a lot of sense, and it's important. 
uh, as you move upwards into, I, well, I would say move upwards. If you, as you move into the games like 5e, 5th edition, um, more and more of the challenges are character sheet challenges, right? Where more and more solutions can be found by clicking the right button on the character sheet rather than by being clever. That's one of my, one of the reasons I moved away from 5e, why I'm moving away from 5e is because I realized that, that so very often the solutions are on the sheet. The player just has to find the right one and press the button. Whereas I, I'm much more interested in sort of being clever and, and you know, risk reward and uh, in uh, players trying to solve players trying to solve the problem, not just saying, well, my character would do this, and then it's solved. <laughs> For example, a great example is the good berry versus running out of food question. If I have good berry, I don't need to worry about food. If I have dark vision, I don't need to worry about light. Um, the, the challenge of darkness, the challenge of running low on supplies that a DM can throw at a player is solved by those buttons, quote unquote, on the player's character sheet. Oh, I'll press the dark vision button and I'm fine. All right, part two, designing a dungeon adventure great idea here. And a first and important distinction is layers as opposed to mega dungeons, right? Two basic dungeon design ideas. Small dungeons, which are layers, and huge dungeons, which are mega dungeons. You can use this book to develop both. But what are you doing and why? Right? Are you doing a mission-oriented layer adventure or are you generating a mega dungeon? Great distinction to make. I think very often I don't make that distinction. I'm like, oh, I'm going to make this cool dungeon where the players are going to do X here, and it's going to have this, and it's going to be that. And by the end, I've developed like 80 rooms. I'm like, this is not su suitable for a site-based short layer adventure. This is not. I totally, you know, I got distracted by coolness instead of focusing on what I needed to do. You get the underlying truth, the backstory here. Capsule backstories purpose, recent use backstories. Uh, you know, this basically builds on and expands on, for example, all of those tables that I showed you in the uh, Gentle's Dungeon Design book. That one is much simpler and straightforward. The tables are all more limited. It's much more easy to use at a, at a, you know, at a pinch. This one is comprehensive. So if you, if you don't have a time restriction and you're really building from the ground up, this book would be much more useful than that, long term especially. You're gonna run out of those tables much quicker than you're gonna run out of these tables. But I mean, again, just table after table after table. <laughs> Here is a, a alphabet alternate. Alternate alphabet is an easy code if you need to use it. There's uh, Enochian based, there's Greek based, and there's Futhark based uh, alphabets. That's insane. <laughs> this book just has that in here. All right, cool. I want to use a Greek alphabet as a, as a puzzle. Yeah, great. You can do that. Even if it's just as a base, you can modify those symbols. Um, and then you have particular ways of generating riddles. Well, not a particular way, but just a, a little bit of advice for generating riddles. The map and different dungeon or dungeon arrangements. I, I think that's a really good idea. Um, now, some of these are, like in my view, not as good. Right, that straight line dungeon. That's just not as good as the others. <laughs> um, nor is that branching one. I think the other three examples that are given here are much better, especially the second and the fifth. I really like those dungeon designs. Um, one is pretty good, but but three and four are not my preference in terms of when you're designing an interesting dungeon with choice for the players. Certainly three is the worst, where you're just doing room after room after room, the players have no choice uh, between where they go. But you get, you know, as you might expect, all of the different random tables that be associated with that. Corridors and features of those bridges, archways, doors and archways, archways distinctive features, normal doors with distinctive features, the material of doors, the color of the doors, opens, how the oddity is about the door. Table, I mean, so many tables just for doors. Tables for waterways, tables for teleportation, uh, tables for topography, for area details. Room sizes and cavern size, rooms of unusual size, arrangements of rooms within an area. And here are different sample diagrams of identical table results. I really like that this is given too. You realize that one table result gives you tons of variation in how you actually lay it out. So even within one result on these rolls, you have varied dungeons to how you want to do it. That's crazy. Uh, area names involving water, areas involving tombs, <laughs> areas involving scholarship or research. This is for naming an area of your dungeon. Imprisonment, worship, bugs, plants, placing landmarks within your dungeon, which is really useful to do, right? Especially if you're building a bigger dungeon, you want geeky players touchstones. Strange things, 
table after table after table. I'm gonna skip ahead because again, there's I'm only 174 pages into this PDF out of 300. So you get tables for tricks, tables for magic tricks, tables for traps, tables for hazards, tables for dungeon dressings, tons of tables for dungeon dressings, magical and normal, tables for plants, tables for magic items, tables for gems and precious stones. Here's a list of all the tables in three. There's 90 random tables in section three. Uh, table, again, just let's look at a couple. Uh, liquids contained that you can find. Unusual lighting effects, NPC interactions, sounds, what comes next using tables, wild card matrix for tricks, spoken clues, pillars, large containers. I mean, again, just infinite. Almost, here's more. Sorry, that was only the first 90. Uh, there's all 91 through 184 on this section of random tables. Choice games, herbs, smells, mar marking off magic marking off magic areas, yeah. Profile of monster ambushes, master sarcophagus table. <laughs> and then book four, which is your non-dungeon adventure design. Right? Aerial adventures, castles and ruins, cities and settlements, planar and under alternate worlds, underwater adventures, waterborne adventures, wilderness adventures, general wilderness tables, desert adventures, forest adventures, hill and mountain adventures, swamp adventures. Goodness. So many tables for all of those things and a complete list of tables from those books, which is... Oh, this is a complete list of tables from the whole book. Here's just the list of tables from book four. You have a hundred tables for book four. And then a complete list of tables throughout the entire book all the way from beginning to end. And then a consolidated index by subject and where you can find tables and relating to that in pages. Oh my goodness. Now this is kind of funny. It says on the back, it says it's Friday night, 6 p.m. You still haven't prepared an adventure. You still need to get to the store and buy snacks. The group is heading over to a game in two hours. What do you do? Don't panic. To use this book effectively takes more than two hours, <laughs> at least in my experience, because it's so big and there are so many tables on tables on tables on tables that you could, you could spend hours and hours developing a mega dungeon. If you wanted to build a small dungeon, yeah, you could use this in just a little bit of time. But man, uh, you could spend hours and hours using this book to develop any dungeon with hyper specificity in terms of the room design and dressing, and it would be great. So in that sense, you would be kind of foolish not to get this book because there's so much here. And in a pinch, again, you can check it and see that there's a table on it. On the other hand, is this going to be for everyone? Some people have their own methods of developing dungeons. A lot of people have their own methods for developing dungeons. And some people don't want to go into this amount of randomness for every dungeon. And they certainly won't, don't want to, you know, <laughs> like go through the whole process each and every time. Some people will. I think you should get the book regardless. I think you should get all three of these books regardless of if you're going to use them practically a lot at the table because they're great inspiration. But especially this Tome of Adventure Design, if you happen to get into the mindset, if you are in the mindset of I'm going to go through these tables, I'm going to go comprehensively, I'm going to create my own dungeon from start to finish without inspiration from elsewhere, just using this book, then you would have, you could make infinite dungeons. And again, they wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be like the same variation of the same like five room dungeon. This is, you're going to get absolutely different adventures every time if you stick to what you rolled randomly. So highly recommend all three books, but just keep in mind what they are. They're not as immediately, at least in my experience, practically at the table useful in terms of like, here's what I would say. None of these books are designed to help you improvise at the table. They're not useful in that regard. And that's the sort of, those are the sorts of tables that I like, tables that help you improvise. I don't think any of these books are gonna do that. But in terms of preparing ahead of time and preparing weird things ahead of time or preparing detailed things ahead of time, and in terms of uh, inspiration, these books are great. So I highly recommend if you tend to be more of a, one of the latter dungeon designers, if you tend to not do, I do a lot of minimalism in my prep and then I give myself a lot of uh, help in terms of improvisation. Lots of tables for names and you know NPCs and quick monster stats and things like that so that I can improvise on the fly. I like that, I tend to play that sort of game. But if you're more of a like, a, I'm gonna sit down and build a dungeon, uh, ahead of time with all the details and the, the NPCs and the tricks and the traps and all of the details about everybody and every room design and every dressing, then wow, these books will be perfect for you. All right, guys. Well, I hope this has been interesting and I'll see you in another video.